let alone actually in the room where the discussions are going on, uh, which are completely unfair. Um, they, on the other hand, there is a certain type of activists that they allow in very easily, and the threshold for them attending is very low in, indeed. So the delegates get a view of these issues that is really, it, to be honest, manufactured in the United States. It's driven by um, uh, American-funded advocacy, um, moderated by American and European groups, and then passed out to lots of uh, grassroots, so-called grassroots organizations or civil society organizations that are anything but civil society. They are professional grant seekers who understand how to get money out of the system and they go on represent a view of civil society in these fora. Um, we're lucky in some ways that its original purpose was to really to generalize good practice in tobacco control, particularly with a focus on developing countries rather than to do too much that's new, okay, too many untried things. And the problem is they have been flirting with trying to do new and untried things such as you know, talking about reducing nicotine, getting involved in vaping and stuff like that when the rest of the world is still trying to catch up on that. And that, proposed, that poses a threat. Um, that poses a threat because first of all they may take concrete measures which are harmful, but basically the real threat comes from WHO um, and the Secretariat and these meetings um, creating what I call an authorizing environment for bad policy. You know, so they will, they will talk up prohibitions, e equal levels of tax on vaping products and cigarettes, um, bad, treating uh, vaping the same as smoking from the point of view of banning in public places, banning all advertising, promotion and sponsorship. That essentially is where they're heading with this, is to treat the harm reduction products exactly the same as if they were um, combustible tobacco products, and that would be a terrible thing. And I hate to say it, they're doing quite well with that agenda. There are now over 30 countries that have an outright prohibition on uh, e-cigarettes, and more will surely follow. Um, so it's a very hard organization to engage with. The key to, the key to it is to understand that all the decisions get made about two or three months before the meeting actually happens. And those decisions uh, essentially get made in capitals. And there's a bit of negotiation at the meeting, but essentially the, all the member states determine their positions well before they go there. And you can influence that. That's the key thing to understand. You can shape the position of your government or the bloc that your government's in at home. And that's where you have the greatest standing, the greatest legitimacy, and the easiest access. Very difficult to do things at the meeting itself. Um, so that's, is that a reasonable yeah, general right. introduction? You know, I mean, we'll round out how awful this is as we go through the <laughs> rest, because it is truly awful. Martin knows better than I do, I think, having attended some of these things recently. Um, I, I have uh, basically uh, five tips on advocacy. Advocacy, have I got time for that? Yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah. Very, I'll do them very quickly. First of all, most advocacy is 80% perspiration, 20% inspiration, okay? It's about being organized. It's about having networks, contacts, email lists, understanding how to get hold of journalists, having the facts at your fingertips, having fact sheets, um, knowing, um, uh, you know, know yeah, knowing the journalists, knowing the, knowing the politicians, being able to engage with them, knowing who to write to, knowing when things are happening. What's the timeline of events where you can get involved? As I say, if you wait till COP9 to start lobbying COP9, you've missed the bus. It has to happen three months or so earlier, or maybe even earlier than that. So get organized, okay? Get organized, that's my number one tip. Secondly, um, basically don't try and be too clever. Um, the, the thing that vapors and consumers have is not an in-depth knowledge of uh, you know, science, epidemiology, toxicology, although many do now, I'm the first to admit they're great self-made experts in this field. But what you really have, and your main asset, is the lived experience and the stories you can tell about what it means to you. Now those cut through in a way that scientific waffle does not cut through. Okay, so people having a battle of papers and charts and graphs and data and everything, find these work, they fight each other to a standstill, and the politicians, well, yeah, one side, I'll just, I'll just pick the one that feels right. 
you have something that creates empathy, you have something that can actually create a bond with a politician who understands, you know, who under, can understand what you're talking about. And possibly the greatest victory, in, uh, certainly in, in our experience, Martin, would be the 2013 overturning of the medicalisation approach in um, the European Parliament. And that worked because thousands of vapors wrote about their lived experience. They didn't write lots of technocratic papers on regulation. My third thing is networking and inclusivity. You are not in competition with the people on the same side as, as you, even if they think slightly different things. I can't believe how much energy goes on inter nissan fighting within what is a broad movement. Stop it. Don't even let it start. You have to accept there are different perspectives within a movement and work with them, not against them. Um, fourth point, um, communications is incredibly important in this. You have to be concise now. The bandwidth of politicians is extremely crowded now with all sorts of stuff coming at them from every direction. We're all saturated with news, with Facebook, with Twitter, with uh, you know a million people trying to get in touch with us. You have to be concise, you have to be straightforward, and you have to get to the point. Okay, if you're going to write a 20-page document, write a one-page summary. Keep, you have to be able to understand what you're talking about in the first line, if it's a written document. You have to be able to explain yourself in 10, 20 seconds, the lift conversation. You have, you have to be able to do that now, otherwise you're dead. Everybody's already lost interest and moved on. And then my final point is don't spend too much time agonizing over your you know, your principles, your organization, your foundational documents, start doing stuff, okay? Start writing letters to newspapers, start approaching politicians, start having lunch with journalists, start engaging. And what you'll find is that that will build, that will build up a head of momentum that makes all the other things that you do much easier to do. It enhances your reputation. People can see that you've written letters in newspapers, the audience recognize that. Um, you know, I'll see that person, they're clearly influential. So that's my number one top advice, is don't hold back, just get started, start getting your views across, get busy, and then it will all build momentum from there. Okay. Thanks, thanks very much, Clive. Um, well, we're going to have plenty of time to ask questions later, so if ever you've got any questions, note them down, we'll get around to you at some point. Um, on that subject, I suppose, could we go to... Just a formal question. Will this be videoed so that it can be viewed uh, after the conference? I do it. Uh, Norbert's got, got it. Okay. I'm doing it. Camera over there. Yeah. Okay. Um, okay, move on to David Sweeney. I've got down, we're going to be talking about principle, principles of advocacy. Is that right? Because I've got the wrong with <laughs> Clive one. Um, David is adjunct professor at uh, the University of Ottawa and they've been involved in this sort of policy area for what, since the 1980s, really. So, um, yeah, for Pastor and Dave, he's going to talk about principles of advocacy. Uh, yeah, I, I think uh, some of the things that uh, Clive has already said, we uh, should all take to heart in terms of how this sort of practice is done. If you're trying to change something, how do you go about doing it? I mean, identifying ideally where you want to be, uh, figuring out how you're going to get there, who are the people you need to influence in order to cause that to happen, uh, and what are the things you need to do to to change those minds, to influence those people, to get to where you want to be. Uh, I think there, there's general rules, and when we're talking about COP, I, I would use the Framework Convention as a really good example of how not to do things. Uh, because they've taken this very top-down approach, and we're going to tell you what to do. Um, it, I, I, I see that sort of approach as being comparable to things like Soviet five-year central planning, uh, you know, it looked good in theory, it didn't work really well in practice. In practice, the sorts of things that, that have worked quite well is being far more entrepreneurial, looking for opportunities as they come along, because the environment is changing all the time. You know, there, there's different sorts of products that are coming up, there's new science that's emerging. Um, there are leaders coming forward from the, the consumer community. Uh, how do you change with these things as they happen? Uh, and be careful about getting too structured uh, and missing those opportunities. So I'd say really focus on being an entrepreneur, uh, that this is really an entrepreneurial art. This is not a science. This isn't like a physics textbook. You know, this is a matter of being creative, looking at what comes along, 
Who are the people who are your, your opponents? How do you counter them? What sort of evidence is coming up? How do you get hold of that? Uh, how do you assert your rights? Because the science and human rights are very much on your side. Uh, those are very, very powerful tools to use. Uh, to be able to, uh, to use them creatively. Uh, to point out the, how ridiculous many of the, the policies of being that oppose vaping. You know, where else do we do things like permit a really, really deadly product, but try to restrict access to things that can replace it that are far less hazardous? You know, that really doesn't make a lot of sense. You know, to say that we don't want people to play tennis, but it's okay if they toss bombs back and forth across the court and see if they can catch them and throw them back before they explode. I mean, we, we, we wouldn't go that way. Uh, so I think, and, and, and keeping track of how the science is developing, and, and I think this is one of the shortfalls of, of taking um, framework convention approach of saying, we know what to do, now we just have to do it. And in reality, you know, human knowledge is developing all the time. Our experience is developing all the time. To try to do a freeze frame, here's what you need to do on taxation, before you know what products are going to be there, is like saying, we're going to organize what we need to tell farmers about the most effective use of the horses on their farm. And then there's tractors. Or we're going to have a policy about the availability of landline telephones so that people can communicate. And then there's mobile technology. Uh, that Trying to adapt to these things is, is very difficult. And I think many of these sorts of things uh, collapse in upon themselves. So we end up with countries coming up with rules that simply don't make any sense. And when people start hearing about it, they, they realize that. When you get people to actually laugh at authority, you know, to laugh at your opponents, to see the absurdity in their arguments, that's an incredibly powerful tool. Uh, and I think we get a lot of opportunities here for you to do that. You know, the idea that that they would be giving relative advantages to a product that kills over half of its long-term users when technology is developed to the point that we have products that are a tiny fraction of the risk. The idea that the people who say, our fight is against those big tobacco companies are the ones who are protecting cigarettes. I mean, that's absurd. I mean, there's so many things that, that we can point out. And then to look at the data, so when the people are saying, no, consumers won't use these products, well, consumers are using these products. We are seeing the biggest declines we have ever seen in smoking, most rapidly that we've ever seen because of substitution, and we're seeing it in numerous countries. So as we point to the examples of what's happening in Japan, what's, what's now happening in the US, uh, uh, despite all the opposition to vaping, how it's driving down sales more rapidly than we have seen. You know, what happened in Norway? What's, what, what was the history in Sweden? What happened in Iceland? Or even here in Europe, what's happening in various cities? You know, the idea that uh, Vilnius, where I, I was uh, last week, you know, over 20% of the, the cigarette market has now moved to heated tobacco products. You know, last year it was less than 5%. Uh, we're seeing huge breakthroughs in, in cities around the world, places we wouldn't have expected. It's happening in real time because consumers are able, able to move. And I think we have that sort of, of evidence. We can talk about reality when other people are, are talking about morality, uh, they're still seeing something as a sin, they're denying that it's happening because it's uncomfortable for them to accept that it's happening. I think in many cases you're in the exact same situation I was early in my career of battling the cigarette companies. You know, they were, they were powerful, they were setting the agenda, but the stuff they were saying was nonsense. It was not scientifically founded. Uh, it was a denial of human rights. And we were able to beat them up pretty bad. And I think we're just seeing a, that whole process happening again. It's just the people who, who should be helping doing things like replacing cigarettes are doing things to protect cigarettes. Um, they, 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 they become their own enemy. Uh, you have the ability to fight back against that. And I think you have an awful lot of tools. Start getting creative. Have fun in what you're doing because it can be a lot of fun changing the world and seeing what sort of impact you have. Thanks, Thanks David. Um, okay, we'll move on to Fiona Patton, who's a, a politician from Australia um, with a very liberal agenda, if I may say, reading from your bi uh, biography here. 
she's the leader of the Reason Party uh, and um, is on the northern uh, the, the leader of the Victorian Par Par Parliament's legislative 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 council. <laughs> uh, a few words to say. Um, and we got down that you're going to talk about some of your successes in areas such as um, separation of church and state, legalising sex work, um, all those sort of things, and, and legalising cannabis as well. Yeah. yeah thank you. Uh, thank you, and thanks very much for having me today. Um, I, I, I think I'm going to learn a lot more than I'm going to be able to, 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 to give um, to you, so I apologise for being greedy. I'll be, I'll be sucking more in than, than giving out. Um, I do inhale myself. Uh, I, sadly, I think to start with, I mean, we have, um, we have appalling laws around e-cigarettes. We have appalling laws around alternative forms of nicotine um, delivery. And I just thought I would just start quickly. Um, uh, uh, three weeks ago, I asked the Minister for Health about this. And um, I just thought I'd just read you the question that I asked, asked her. Um, and then I won't read you her complete answer because it was just bollocks. But I will, um, I'll, I'll give you the big good bits. Well, actually, they're not good bits, bad bits. Um, my question is for the Minister for Health and regards e-cigarettes, or more properly called vaporisers. About one in eight cancer deaths in Australia can still be attributed to smoking, underlying the importance of cessation strategies to our health system. The UK Medicines Re Regulator has approved a brand of vaporisers as an aid to help people stop smoking. Um, 64 scientific studies now demonstrate that smoke-free products like vaporisers are less harmful than traditional cigarettes. Um, the prestigious New England Journal of Medicine, which I think maybe I'm quoting one of the panellists here, um, demonstrated that one year abstinence rate was 18% in the vaporizer group compared to 9% in nicotine replacement therapies. So my question was, would she revisit the laws and, and revisit the Tobacco Amendment Act um, in light of the emerging evidence? Oh, well, she said, uh, I'm pleased that you quoted that, that report and not one by the tobacco companies. Um, and we know that children, um, we know that children are using them. That's why we keep them banned. We know that they're the gateway for children. Um, they renormalize smoking. Um, there's, and she goes on. Um, basically saying that um, in recognising that we have very high smoking rates, particularly in our indigenous, um, our, our indigenous area, but she doesn't believe that e-cigarettes or any other form of um, replacement is a solution there. Just say no. Just say no. That's her response. Now, in thinking about where I've had successes, and I think this is almost more, di no, it's not disappointing, but I'm very pleased that we're in the, we've, we have a trial for a medically supervised injecting centre to help people who are heroin users or other opioid users from overdosing and dying. Um, now we ran a very good campaign and we got that up. So we were able to have a trial for a centre to allow people to inject an illicit substance um, in a safe health care facility. Uh, I got the AMA, our Australian Medical Association, to support that. I got the police to support that. I got pretty much almost every medical organisation to support that. Um, Dr Alex Wodak, who's in the room today, has been a major pioneer and campaigner on that. Um, and we were able to see that change. We are not, we are getting knocked back um, on vaporising. Cigarette, it's interesting, tobacco smokers are seen, as we know, as you know, immoral. Um, that you know, the, no, it, that it's their fault. Interestingly, not heroin for most people. We see that heroin people can't help themselves. Um, so we need to help them, and we need to provide safer options for them, and we need to reduce that harm. Uh, but we're not taking the same approach to tobacco users. So looking at the success of how we did the Supervised Injecting Centre, just as a brief, um, I guess, model, uh, bring the people along with you. So when we decided that this was 
the campaign that we were going to run, we looked at who are our, our allies and who can we bring along there. So I need to, I've brought along the ambulances that were constantly going to the overdoses. We brought along the, the medical authorities. We brought along the hospitals. We brought along the, the traders in the area. We brought along the residents in the area. And in fact, the residents were probably one of the major um, advocates. And, in, and if it hadn't been for their personal stories around the experiences of living in a drug epicentre, we may not have seen that change. So it's, re it's certainly reiterating the notion of those personal stories. So we brought all of those people together and it was as a team and as a, as a consolidated group that we could present to our politicians, me being one of them. Um, and I think that, that is a very important, that bring your allies on. You know, don't start fighting amongst each other, but also, you know, I, I would love to see the dentists come on board. Um, you know, we know that the effects of, of, of smoking that has on, on, um, on, mat, on, our, on, our, on our oral health. Um, but we, you know, so uh, those, we can't get the medical doctors at the moment, so hopefully we could get someone like the dentists um, to come on board. But it is consolidating those, those people. Don't send politicians um, t 10 pages. Uh, one page is great, but do consolidate the research for us. Um, I'm an independent, and in one day I will be looking at abalone farming, um, public transport systems, and um, and and poss possibly some drug systems, but more likely to be some really boring tax. Uh, for, <laughs> although taxes, and finally, I think um, money talks. So if you can talk about the health economics of. Um, of, of new nicotine replace of new nicotine delivery systems, then if we can say we're going to save the save the state this much money, this is going to cost you less. Um, quite often, particularly for the Tories, particularly for the Conservatives, um, it is those messages that actually work well um, for them. Uh, so I'll, I'll leave it there. But um, yes, I'll leave it there. Thanks. I've got a little question for you, if, if you don't mind. Um, how much do you think what's happening in New Zealand at the moment over e-cigarettes is going to sway in Australia? And uh, while Greg Hunt once said, is it Greg Hunt, the Minister once said he's not going to legalise uh, vaping on his watch, the famous he said, um, I've seen signs that things are maybe teetering a little bit in Australia. Do you think there's much evidence that things might change because of what's happening in other countries? I think New Zealand, it's sort of, it's like nice Australia. I mean, they're, they're, just, um, they're just that little bit better than us in most things. Um, and, you know, I mean, Jacinda Ardern, we, we just all want to adopt her. Um, we'd like to adopt New, New Zealand um, and, and have it part of Victoria. I, I'm, I just don't think the New Zealanders are all that interested, um, sadly. It, look, it may have an effect, um, but you know, there's many times when New Zealand has done wonderful progressive things, and we've just looked on like there's some you know mad little nephew that we've got racing around doing clever things. Uh, I, I hope it does, and I think certainly um, some of the work, and I'm sure we're going to hear about it today around um, indigenous indigenous groups and Maori groups, and I'm suspecting there's some people in the audience going to talk about this later, but. That was, um, I, I've, I've put that to my, um, to my Aboriginal groups around. So looking, so I am trying to, to, to open the door through those marginalised groups. So again, not just the, the evil smokers, um, but, but looking at those disadvantaged groups and seeing if I can get a little bit more compassion for them. So yes, what New Zealand's doing is, is good. Australia, um, I, you know, I, I think we've, we've still a long way to go with Greg Hunt. Okay, thank you very much. Um, we'll go on next to uh, Kim. Uh, Kim, what's your title at the moment? Is it Acting, acting Director General acting, or something? Acting General Secretary. Okay, acting General Secretary of uh, the International or in Network of Nicotine <laughs> Consumer <laughs> Organisations. <laughs> yes. so, uh, I should have been practising that. Yeah. Um, now, um, you, you organised some sort of events at COP8, and you were going to go through maybe 
what you might not have done right that time and how we can correct it for COP9 perhaps, yeah? Yes. First of all, I'm going to say to Clive, but thank you for that. <laughs> all of those advices, advices we did wrong. <laughs> okay. uh, no, we tried some of them. We did try in all the member countries to engage the journalists, to engage the politicians, to engage the stakeholders. That and, and try to figure out who is going to be sent to the COP. That, I think, worked in one country. Uh, and in one country, there was complete silence on their part just until just before the guy for the delegation left on the plane. So he sent it directly on the tarmac that, no, I can't speak to you. <laughs> I'm leaving. It's too late. <clears throat> and that was months of work. Mm. Uh, the other thing that we, we went in and tried to get a service status, because at that time we still fulfilled all of their requirements. Uh, it's a discussion whether we still do it or not. And we're not going to get a choice next time. Uh, the the secretariat should actually make a recommendation based on facts and explain why we should be accepted, rejected, <coughs> or I don't think that I can't remember the third choice. There is one. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Executed. No, that's thrown out. Sorry, we couldn't be. Uh, and. They said, no, we recommend that you get, re get, get not accepted. And we were like, yeah, but you need to give a reason. Yeah, well, we have an email trail that's very long and one-sided trying to get that explanation. We tried our country delegates. Did you get an explanation? No. And the secretariat, when we finally got through to them, said, oh, that's the countries that decide. So basically, we, we were turned into a roundabout on that. So we tried to get the countries to vote against it or object against it. Uh, and that didn't work either. The other thing, we were too few people, uh, and we tried to play it nice. We were standing around at the broken chair, some 20 organizations, and no one came. And that was the area they delegated for us. No delegates ever get, got there at all. Um, many go did have a bit of success. They captured their delegate outside of the, outside of the venue and talked to him and actually got some responses. But most of them went, we're not seeing you. Uh, and we learned quite a lot of lessons. And I'm not a good speaker, so I'm, I'm going to make this quick. We've made lots of plans for the next one, and we've tried to we started uh, in the beginning of this year, and one of the first things we did was contact you, the actual organization on the ground with the car. Uh, and you will tell about that. <coughs> and there's a huge amount of work that's going into this, and for the advocacy organizations, the, the consumers, we need you to engage, because you're not, most of you. And we hope, hope, because it's depending on funding, to have a lot of countries send a lot of people there, because we need to protest it. Finally, I'm going to say one thing about um, when we actually got into the COP. 
there was a lady from Africa, which I was, I was amused about. She was complaining that this particular session, it, it shouldn't be open, because last time, that when it was open, someone actually told her boss what she said. <laughs> oh my God! And she got yeah, and she got really, really bad reviews at home. So, with that, I think. Okay, uh, as uh, thanks, Kim. thanks, great. Um, as Kim mentioned there, um, the Netherlands is quite important because it's where COP nine is going to be happening, and we have. Evelyn Hondius here, who's from the Netherlands. Uh, this is here, marketing specialist and trainer, and who quit vaping two years ago. And so now is the, the board member of Acvoda, which is the Dutch Vaping Consumer Association. So um, I wrote down you're talking about INCO and consumer organisation plans for COP, but um, you could probably give us a little insight about what what to expect in the Hague as well, Juan Thank, thank you, thank you so much all for your. Uh Great speeches. Uh, unfortunately, I cannot give you that much information about COP9 at this point because we don't know anything. And we're not in the loop, so <laughs> they won't tell us. So um, I was asked by Jessica to tell you something about the environment and harm reduction policy in the Netherlands. And I can be very sure there is no harm reduction policy. The Netherlands has a prevention agreement and that prevention agreement doesn't necessarily focus on harm reduction. The only thing they want is to prohibit everything that is bad. So basically, they have an agreement that says in 2040, uh, no one's allowed to smoke. There's a smoke-free generation that is starting right now. Um, and it focuses on smoking as well as obesity <coughs> and um, alcohol abuse. For us, alcohol abuse and obesity is not necessarily uh, a thing that we should be focusing on right now. But smoking and vaping uh, for the Dutch law is kind of the same. Albeit that it is possible to buy five cartons of cigarettes and use them any way you like. But you can only get the 10 milliliter bottle of liquid. So as um, I think it was David who said, it's really weird that the harmful alternatives are very freely available. You can buy them anywhere. And even though there is an age limit of 18, uh, it's not really enforced. So in the Netherlands, um, Vaping is used as a is seen as a byproduct, and they want to make it a smoking. Um, they want to use it as um, an example. We're not using it as a harm reduction. They don't want you to vape, so they are going to try and get people to not vape. You you can't smoke either. Necessarily, I mean seriously, you, they don't want you to do anything at all. Just be healthy. Just quit, as Fiona said. There is one um, advocate for uh, quitting smoking, which is uh, Mrs. De Conter. She has a really big audience in the Netherlands, and the only thing she says is just quit cold turkey. There's no alternative that could ever help you. Yeah, there's one. Well, no, blowing soap bubbles. Yes, yeah, blowing soap bubbles. <laughs> really? That's what you're saying. If you've got the urge to do something, blow soap bubbles. <laughs> yes. And she has a really big audience and she has a really big mouth, uh, but she doesn't want to go into a discussion with anyone. If you go into a discussion with her on Twitter, you just get blocked. And the only thing she says is, it's for the children, it's for the children. Think about the children. Um, so. In the Netherlands, all of the consumers, they, they have, haven't a clue what, what's going on. Rules and regulations are not being um, communicated very clearly. So the TPD-1, they just go like, this is TPD-1. And then everyone went, so what's happening? Oh, you cannot buy that big tank, it has to be two milliliter. Or um, you're a smoker. You're not a vapor, you're a smoker, so you have to be in a smoking area. Um, and there's lots of confusion. 
because in Germany it's different, in Belgium it's different, and even worse. And with the new TPD, people are straying towards illegal activities. We have home brewers, we have people who order from China, from Belgium even, um, from Germany. <laughs> but it's true because the Belgians can send it to us, but they cannot get it online. So they'll get it anywhere. And they are dissatisfied, but unfortunately, there's just a reaction to that, to the rules. There is no action. So we have our keyboard warriors who sit there uh, behind their social media accounts being really angry, but just that, just replying to everyone saying either um, vaping is smoking so it's bad, or vaping is good, but I don't like the way they want it to be. But they don't do anything. They just sit there and comment on everything. And there are some initiatives. Some of the trade organizations try to work together, but unfortunately um, it's been turned down because they see each other as competitors and not as a combined group working against this regulation. Uh, and it's really weird, because let's be honest, the Netherlands has always been a country where that is progressive in everything. They were progressive with methadone buses for people who were an addict. They are progressive when it comes to um, marijuana. Ah, that's mm -hmm. one. Marijuana. Uh, it's legal. Mm -hmm. People from England go to the Netherlands to get CBD oil because it's illegal in 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 the UK. It's just it's just really weird, <coughs> and that's uh, what we hope to change. But Agvoda is a small group of people. And even though we've been lobbying for more members, it's uh, impossible, almost impossible, to get people to respond and react. To actually do something. Mm -hmm. Rea reacting, they do. Yes. Mm -hmm. On Twitter, on Facebook, yes. wherever. And the most reactions is, this is ridiculous, where can I get my 100% pure nicotine? Yes. And that's what's being important. In such quantities in the Netherlands that now China refuses to send to the Netherlands because their supplies are dwindling. <laughs> you can order, but then the waiting game starts and it takes about six months, seven months before you get it. Mm -hmm. it's, it's really ridiculous. Mm -hmm. and, and to counter all the regulations, um, we see that now the vape shops and the online vape shops, um, they're changing. We've got a lot of cake and flavor shops now mm -hmm. because flavorings and ingredients for cake are not regulated. So you can buy your PG, your VG, your, your aromas. The only thing you can't buy is the nicotine. And they have different, the, the original site or the original vape shop is just reduced to a nicotine booster selling point. And that's all, they've got a separate cake shop where you can buy everything else. It's, it's, it's beyond ridiculous. <laughs> And, and the Dutch don't really do anything, they just sit there and but take it. it. Yeah. It's not ridiculous because I suppose it's efficient in uh, making people stop stopping smoking. Oh, but I, I'm, I'm talking about the consumers who don't do anything. Yeah, they, we. Uh, do we agree uh, that all those countries are one level Yes. Uh, we used to think uh, similar that consumers <coughs> don't do nothing, but I think that we have made a little change. I understand that many of the things that we have to do, we have to keep it in secret until we do it. Yes. And that makes that the other consumer feel outside the, the problem or how they can uh, help us. Some, about a month ago, we organized a, a demonstration, parade, or something like that, in the street, in front of the minister. And we also think that no one of the papers will came. But was a success. Uh, and I think that we have to think how to make do those people yeah. feel part, keeping the secret that we need to keep, but try to give them the most information that we can that won't give the enemies 
true. The inside enemies, because yes, you so just true. told that we have the problems of different people that feels like they are enemies when we have to work in group. But it's not like that really. We have the same uh, appreciation, but the bakers stand and go and they really want to be part of it. We have to, to look forward yes. for that. Okay, I've got a sense a lot of frustration yeah. about um, <laughs> lack of um, action from vapors. So can I can I just uh, I, I guess as a slight counter, I mean it's 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 illegal to, to vape nicotine in, in Australia. Yeah. So um, most of the people who are vaping are breaking the law um, very openly. But when we were, when we had um, the, the latest piece of legislation in my state, which was to further restrict um, the sale of vaporizers, um, you know, forget nicotine, we don't have any problem. We're getting it from China very quickly. Um, <laughs> although we do sometimes just buy it from New Zealand because they're so nice. Um, but we did, get the va we did get the vaping community, they did activate during that, that piece of legislation. Now, it wasn't, they weren't successful, but they, they wrote to every member of parliament and they wrote beautiful, heartfelt letters about their experiences and about the life changes that vaping had, had upon them or upon their families. The, the, one, the one, we did have a demonstration at the front of Parliament House, um, and I think about 30 consumers came. Now, just, it was the bellows of um, vape and, and, and it was the sort of, you could, the mist and you could barely see the people and that, and that frightened the politicians. Like not many of them passed, you know, 10th grade science. So they think you're on fire. They, they don't realize that you're not, but they think that you're a fire hazard. So just, I, 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 we, we, it was something we took away from that protest saying, maybe don't be quite so voluminous with, um, with your vape. Yeah, that's a good point. I, I, I think um, I make this point quite a lot. Um, I've written in articles about it. When people see those plumes of vapour, they think mm. that's what vaping is all about. Mm. And I've always tried to... We'd be able to sit down at the end of the day and try to work out how many people do that compared with people who've just got things like this that no one notices. And the point I was making is that every person you see cloud chasing like that, there's probably 40 or 50 others that you would never even notice. Yeah. And I think that's the point to make on that. Yeah. Um, do you want to add anything to that, Clive? Because it came no, up. Let's give some questions. Yeah, OK. Um, but we've got a fair amount of time. Um, I think we've got 25 minutes for questions. So um, I'd just ask, um, if you do ask a question, can you make it a question rather than a great long statement with a, a, a redundant question mark at the end of it? And, then, so, um, yeah. and can you introduce who you are and, and maybe stand up as well, if you can? Yes, Mark from Germany. I have one question from you from the Netherlands. Do you have, um, do you know how many vapors do you've got uh, regarding the amount of smokers? Is there a percentage? Um, there is. It, it's, um, it, it, it's um, uh, not a fixed percentage, let's say. It, it's, um, it's not well documented, but Let's say it's about one vapor in every four smokers. Maybe wow. you should introduce yourself, Rob. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Who measures it? And the development? Uh, it's growing. It's growing. growing. Okay. Okay. Um, I'm, I'm Rob, also from Agvoda. Um, and where, did the, where did the figures on that come from? <laughs> from us, we um, there are different government's reports. They're not. Uh, put together, so we try to, to to pick relevant data and to compare it. So it's not something. Um, that, let's say I won't put my hand in the fire to say it's that's the, the exact figure, no. but it's about that. Uh, I'll just find out back at you. What's the situation in Germany? Oh no, but please help me. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> we are about four million vapors. Uh, Oh, Four million. Yes. It depends on uh, who you ask. Uh, some some say two million, some say four million. Somewhere in between, that number will be the correct, I guess. Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks. Um, yeah, Roberto, could you speak up from the back there? Yeah. One question about uh, ne the Netherlands. Uh, some time ago, we signed a letter uh, by by Robert Walker. What's his name? We all signed a letter. Lynn Dawkins. Lynn Dawkins. 
Uh, yeah, yes, and uh, was, uh, the latter was uh, rather trying to influence the parliament and so on. And uh, I, I would like to know if that letter had an effect. Um, yes, none. <laughs> <laughs> it was practically laughed away. By whom? By, by the people who were sent, which to the people who you sent the letter. We asked about it, and, and we also um, <laughs> sent the letter of her own. And um, the only, let's say, response you got that had any, um, um, that was just not just pure nonsense was, well, what's, what's the rest of the world got to do with how we do our politics? <laughs> So why should we listen even? But you, you, you should say then it's a banana republic. <laughs> <laughs> I'm serious that uh, I think we have to lose respect for these people. Mm -hmm. and start telling them, start, the, the, start being less diplomatic. Yeah. We've yeah. tried and that's only got us further away from the discussion. Yeah. We, we had some influence and we had some contacts in government and there is a, a national governmentally sponsored, uh, non-biased research organization which produces the research um, which supports what the Dutch government wants to say. So, um, and we had some people there and they actually told us um, that they were not allowed to talk to us anymore. Okay. Um, has anyone got any questions? Not about the Netherlands? <laughs> <laughs> uh, yes. Hi, I'm Mark Oates, uh, Snooze User Association uh, UK. Um, are we doing enough at election time to mobilise voters so that they know which parties are the best ones to vote for? Okay, yeah, I'll just um, say to people who don't know, Mark, you're a researcher in the UK Parliament, aren't you? Right, yeah, that's yeah. right. Does anyone want to take that one? Um, it's, it's a very good idea because, you know, if, if, if if politicians think that they may lose their job over this issue, you may see, see them starting to change. If also, when we see so many political parties trying to be as exactly the same as the other political parties, so that there's very little sunlight between the two, if they see one diverging on this issue, that may also result in a, in a rethink from the other parties. So I think it is really important. Um, I know the vaping, in, the vaping community in, in Victoria um, with very limited success, certainly put out how to vote cards on election day to say which candidates and which parties supported vaping and supported law reform and which parties didn't. Um, however, they, uh, they probably only had about 10 people handing out, so didn't get in the hands of too many people. But it is a very good idea. Just a quick comment. Um, there's a brilliant book actually um, by uh, a US political strategist called Mark Penn and the book was called Micro Trends. Uh, I do recommend it if you, want to, if you want to get on top of this. But what he basically, I've forgotten whose co-author was, I'm sorry. Um, what he basically did was identify uh, trends that were growing in the US population. And he said, look, if there's a group of people that have 1% of the population have an important thing in common, then that's a micro trend and you need to be across it from a, a political strategy point of view. And of course the vaping prevalence um, in, um, uh, well certainly in the UK it's now about, uh, I think about 5% isn't it? Um, uh, it's probably around that in the United States, it's a bit less than some European countries. So vaping in his book and in his strategy thinking would count as a micro trend and it should be a group of users who the political parties and politicians pay attention to, uh, at very little cost to them, they can start saying the right things. The, in the interesting thing is that the opposition to vaping probably doesn't count as a micro-trend. Uh, it's a few well-heeled organisations, uh, a few people who, who would probably not, their vote probably would not be swayed one way or the other by a policy on vaping. They're, you know, probably likely to be sort of liberal left, you know, left, left of centre types. So it, it is, I agree completely with you, it is a force that ought to be harnessed here. The trick is when do, you, when do you do that? How do you get that moving? 
how, you know, you should be really engaging before manifestos are written, not after manifestos are written and uh, on the, um, on the you know, run up to the election itself. So again, it needs a piece of strategy to do that, but it's definitely a good idea to do it. I'll just add one point on that. Um, uh, some of you won't know this, but there's a, a UK colourful political character called George Galloway, um, who once said that when he was an MP, um, if you got five letters on a subject in, in the space of a week, then they would hold a meeting about it. So like, like Clive said, have a strategy and sort of like get your letters into your local representatives and see if you can change policy. That way. Uh, yeah, Jeannie. Jeannie Cameron, um, my question is about divide and conquer. And I think it was you, David, who alluded to. One of the things I think is that regardless of whether you as an advocate are promoting um, a vaping product, a snus product, or a heated tobacco product. Yeah, thanks. I, I don't know if you heard me, so I'll, uh, divide and conquer. I think it's, um, it's a real issue. Um, whether you are an advocate promoting um, uh, vaping, whether uh, snorsing, whether heated tobaccoing, whichever one of those things, I think while there is um, people aren't together on the same page pushing the issue of alternatives, whichever one that you are representing or that is your consumer choice or what, it's really important, I think, not to slag off the other ones and to be inclusive as you go forward talking to all these decision makers because I constantly hear arguments put which really only factor in one of those things and I think while there is this divide and conquer and not an inclusivity of all those who wish to use safer alternatives. So I just wanted to ask your view as experts in this area on that particular point. Uh, yeah, just, um, also, also add between different brands of e-cigarettes themselves as well. Jewel is getting a lot of pressure at the moment in the UK from vapors who just don't see them, you know, they, they see them as trouble. So, yeah, it's okay. Um, so, thank you for that question because I think in um, what we see in the Netherlands, there are actually some um, long doctors who do uh, give out harm reduction and options. They do not tell you, quit cold turkey or use an e-cigarette. They give you all the possibilities and then they let you choose. And there are even some that people can get reimbursed from their insurance. But unfortunately, there's a big group who just says, you, don't, you shouldn't do that. You should just quit cold turkey or use patches or gum because there's a lot of money behind that. And the GlaxoSmithKline and, uh, of the world, they don't want any other... Um, possibility for quitting smoking and they have a big vote in that but there are some who do it and I know that there are some uh, OBGYNs who actually tell pregnant women if you can't quit try something else that is less harmful so they're small initiatives but there should be more um. Kim, this came up in the uh, INCO meeting earlier, didn't it? About how um, everyone's talking about vaping and maybe missing out on things like heat not burn as well. That you should, yes. you should kind of uh, have harm reduction as a whole uh, uh, pressure point in itself, you know, because harm reduction is the policy that we're chasing, not just liberalising vaping and, and, yeah, and snooze and things like that as well. <laughs> yeah. so. I don't know what to say because I agree completely. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but. Um, by the way, our, our enemies are doing divide and conquer rather, rather well. You were saying something about dentists. Yeah. Uh, snus doesn't cause cancer. Yeah. So the cancer institute is saying, you go to the dentist because they are going to tell you something ugly. <laughs> you want to really? Yeah. yeah. I just but want... it is about consolidating forces, this, absolutely. Yeah. I, I just wanted to back up what Jeannie says. I mean, the key distinction is between combustion and not combustion. It's not between tobacco and vape. Uh, it's not between tobacco and non-tobacco. It's not between cold products and heated products. It's between combustion and non-combustion. And the key thing for a consumer, the key consumer interest, and forgive me for telling me you what, <laughs> what I think your interest is, because I'm not one, um, it is about choice. It isn't about being able to get exactly the product you want. It's about having the greatest possible choice. 
Um, part, partly because you don't know how your own preferences may change over time and uh, at different times of day. Partly because you don't know how the market will evolve, you don't know how your own tastes will evolve in different circumstances. But also because as consumer advocates, you're advocates for all consumers, not just yourself. So it's a complete no-brainer to me. You should be advocates for the entire category of non-combustible products, recognising there are differences between them, but the similarities in health terms are far greater than the difference. Um, the, the, the similarities are far greater than the difference between these products and smoking combustible products. Okay, thanks. We've got a question at the back. Yeah. There's a button on the front, yes, press until it turns green, I think. You are the mic. Mike Obeyan, New York State Vapor Association. For a lot of years, we've been fighting with regulators in the US. And the regulators are frequently influenced by three-letter organizations, of course, who are anti everything that's you know not pharmaceutical products. And what's worked in the past has always been to present them with data and say, here are the studies that show that your statements that these three-letter organizations are giving you are not true. Here's our research, here's the studies, here's the citations, here's the references, and that's always worked in the past. Now we're at a point where they're like, yeah, I don't, I don't care. I don't care. Or I'm not reading all of these studies, so too bad. Um, so what are our options now in trying to present people who literally are not willing to look at facts and truth and science? Um, well, you're North, North American person on this panel, so... <laughs> um, the, the death of truth is, uh, is very real. Um, uh, not just in the U.S., but the U.S. is certainly taking a, a huge lead <laughs> in doing this. Uh, I think... Uh, challenging them on where they've got things wrong. This isn't the first time that bodies like the Centers for Disease Control have missed the boat on an important public health issue. Uh, I can give you sites from Jane Jacobs' wonderful book, uh, Dark Age Ahead, about how they completely missed what killed so many elderly people in a heat wave in Chicago, because they went in with a pre-existing view and they only looked to confirm it. And all it took was one person to look at the data and say, you're wrong, and here's why. Uh, here, it's amazing that in the US, I think one of the advantages is an awful lot of people in the US really don't pay attention uh, to uh, what they're told by authorities. Uh, and amazing things are happening despite all the opposition. Uh, so that it's, it's the, the idea that cigarette sales are falling markedly in the United States that the number of smokers is, is going down, the number of vapors is going up, the estimates of the number of vapors, the reports that come out from uh, uh, Wall Street every four weeks on the Nielsen data, uh, following what's happening with cigarette sales, and it is dramatic. Uh, and they also show how vaping sales are going up as cigarette sales go down. It's, it's one of those mirror image graphs. Uh, to be able to use this stuff and you know, I'm, I'm very big on the idea of, of using humor about, uh, you know, how people can just miss things and how ridiculous it looks, how funny it is that they miss the obvious. Uh, and again, to quote Jane Jacobs, the, uh, the history of public health is about people being detectives, the history of science, of human advancement, of the, the idea you look for information from every source you possibly can. You are curious. You're trying to figure out, you know, whether it's why some people got cholera in the 1850s and other people didn't. People like John Snow, you know, why did, did the, the milkmaids not get smallpox, Jenner? And then we get to the point of people saying, I don't want to look. Like, where are they coming from? This stuff is happening right in front of their faces. They all know people who have quit smoking by vaping, and they're denying that it's happening. They can see what's happening to cigarette sales. There is no other rational explanation. The CDC has people who say, we don't accept that vaping is reducing smoking because we don't see the evidence. Well, talk about blind. I mean, you're, this is the sort of detective that walks into the room, you know, and somebody's got a knife in their stomach saying, Glyph Bates did it! 
And they said, we have no idea, you know, what, what could have caused this. You know, we're pretty certain that it's, that it's natural causes. Uh, that, so so when, when they miss something, like to say, so you're missing the reports from the companies themselves to the Securities and Exchange Commission. You go to jail if you lie to the Securities and Exchange Commission. Wall Street analysts are putting all this information together. Nielsen data is showing all of this. It is coming out in, in, in surveys of consumers. Try to explain how there's so many thousands of vape shops and how Juul got a valuation of tens of billions of dollars if nobody's doing this. I mean, the evidence is all over. Uh, so I, I think the idea of being able to to challenge them, to ridicule them, to get people to laugh at them is what's necessary to get them back into actually paying attention to the concept of truth. Yeah, okay, thanks. <laughs> thanks for that. Um, I'd just like, I know that was about uh, America, but I'd just like to ask Fiona, to, uh, because you're getting the same sort of thing in Australia, you're getting maybe one, two or three key public health professors who are just refusing to look at the evidence, cherry picking stuff and giving that to government. Yeah. So how do we get past that in Australia? Um, look, I think it's going to be brute force, basically. We're going to have to beat them to it. Um, but, you, but you're absolutely right. I mean, there's a small minority, and, um, and the Cancer Council being one of them, that refuses. And in fact, the head, who's the head of the Cancer Council, Alex? Todd? Um, you know, he was on radio the other day. And the, 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 the interviewer said, what about the numbers of vapours? Um, you know, because we... We, our d reduction in smoking has, has pretty much stagnated in Australia. And he said, well, what about vaping? You know, we're seeing a lot more of it. He said, oh, no, that doesn't happen. <laughs> and, um, and the interviewer said, well, it does. I mean, like, it's, you see it more and more outside. He said, well, no, it's not really, it's not really true. Um, so this sort of the end of truth. And, and I, I do think we do have to just keep pushing the evidence. I was just re reading over the the answer to the minister gave me, and she said, I think we'll just have to agree to disagree on this. You know, the evidence yeah. from the New England, you know, yeah. university, and then the evidence from around the place. But I just think we have to keep hammering them, and we have to keep building it up. But we also have to get on board our associations, our medical associations. I mean, that, in, in other harm reduction areas, that is how we have created that path is by getting on to... Uh, so if we're hitting a block, block which we are with the Cancer Councils and the, the, the three sort of academics that run that, let's start moving sideways and let's start finding what other allies we can find who understand harm reduction, who support the, the philosophy of harm reduction, because frankly the Cancer Council doesn't. They support abstinence. They do not support harm minimisation or harm reduction. Just... Uh Spike, a, a very quick question, a point on your question. It really depends on who's doing this, but there's a one kind of universal rule is that everybody is accountable to someone or something. Um, so if it's a charity, uh, a non-profit, it has a board. It is governed by charity law, uh, you know, non-profit law. Um, they can't just do whatever they want to do. They have to do the right thing. If it's the FDA, then they are subject to oversight in Congress, a friendly uh, Congress uh, person can uh, engage with them, and they're subject to constraints under, I think it's the Administrative Procedures Act, they have to act lawfully. If it's uh, some, uh, a staffer in Congress, or it's um, um, you know, a, a, an actual elected official, then you have a, they, they're held accountable politically. But I think it's always a good question to ask, who is this person accountable to? Okay, and then say, right, how, how would it be if, you know, the guy who runs Campaign for Tobacco Free Kids kept finding that every time he says something that's wrong, inappropriate, and that is a lot of times, <laughs> a letter goes to the chair of the board of, uh, you know, Campaign for Tobacco Free Kids saying, this is basically untrue for the following reasons. You have a duty to run, see that this organisation is run properly according to the law and you are liable. You know, do we ever do that? Actually, no. We're not hardball enough to do that, but that's where we should be going. We should be looking at the lines of personal accountability that people have. Uh, we've got time for maybe a, uh, a couple more questions. Have we got Andy here? 
Hi, I'm Andy Morrison from uh, Scotland. I'm a consumer and an, and an advocate, obviously. Um, question for both Clive and Fiona. Um, I find it extremely difficult to find a sweet spot between being controversial and maybe aggressive to get your point across and being too nicey nicey to keep the to keep people on your side um, but not necessarily get your point across forcefully enough. Uh, is there a sweet spot that we should be looking for uh, from your point of view as being a politician and uh, being on often the receiving end of what advocates have to say and from Clive as being a brilliant uh, advisor for consumers and advocates. Always gets this wrong by the way. So. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, I've got, a pretty, I've got a pretty thick skin these days so um, I, I get a lot of criticism. I, I do think it is difficult and it, you know, it, it is, it, you know, it, the, it's kind of the emperor has no clothes sort of scenario when I mean, you can't, you, you, even though they're being morons and idiots on this, you can't actually call them out and tell them they're being morons and idiots. Yeah, and but you do need to be firm. And I think using the evidence, speaking the speaking the truth, and and using that um, is is our strongest weapon. And it is our and and it will work. But we yeah, it's it, but you need to be firm with that. Yeah. You know, like with you know the minister for health saying we'll have to agree to disagree on the evidence. Um, you know. Don't worry, I'm coming back to her on that. Um, you know, she hasn't heard the last, and she she does note that I asked her 150 questions on the notice paper about about smoking and vaping, and um, uh, she didn't. Well, yeah, she agreed to disagree. But yes, I, I think use the evidence, but use it firmly. I mean, I, I spent 10 years as a civil servant, and one of the things you're trained in very early on is how to be really nasty and rude to people in an excruciatingly polite way. <laughs> <laughs> it's, a, it's a real art. Yeah. Okay, but I, I will say this. You will never, ever lose by being polite, by being respectful, but you can lose everything by being too aggressive. doesn't mean you can't be passionate uh, and uh, genuinely sincere and authentic, uh, but really keep the rage in a bottle, don't get personal, don't get, um, you know, don't accuse people of things, of lying, or any of that stuff. It just doesn't work, but it cuts everything off. Be, be in a kind of analytical, cool, clear, if you're telling a story about yourself, tell it, you know, cool, calm, but you can do that with a degree of passion, and that's what I think actually works. Mm. Okay, and um, we're going to have to wrap up, so we've got a question from Alex, and I think there's one over here, yeah, and sure, but if I'll be very short, we can get to it. So far we've had uh, three court cases that I'm aware of in New Zealand, in Quebec, and last week in uh, the Swiss Federal Court that have found in favour of um, tobacco <coughs> harm reduction. Uh, is this a strategy that we, that is court proceedings, that we should be using more of? And if so, what would be the role of consumers in that action in the future? But you want to answer that? Yes. Uh, they, these are incredibly powerful when you've got people doing absurd things that violate your right to life. Uh, we usually have laws that give you levels of protection. So whether it be a charter of rights, a constitution, human rights legislation, um, consumer protection legislation, it can all be used. There's some that you can use at very little cost. So consumer rights and, uh, legislation is something I used a lot early in my career because it costs nothing uh, to, uh, to submit uh, the complaints. Right, um, we'll be granted a few more minutes by our director here. Um, so we're going to check James and then Bengt. Hey James, I work for the Cigarette Direct and the Ashtray Block. Uh, in, in the run-up to the fight in the EU over e six and the attempt to medicalise it, we spoke to our uh, MEP and said what the difference that what made a difference to her was all the stories from consumers. My question is, how do we get more consumers involved? And what lessons can we learn from other successful campaigns? Um, I think, Kim, do you want to answer that one? <laughs> The easy answer is, if you can do it while you're sitting down, they will do. Yes. But, <laughs> and fortunately, the stories, anecdotes, are one of the things that you can do while sitting down. So that's one thing that you can do, but 
and people are using that effectively. But at some point, the politicians are also going to be mad at you. Uh, have you also, I mean, what with the small campaign we ran in Victoria, um, the, the vape shops were very involved in that. So the vape shops were the ones that were engaging and encouraging their customers to, to write to me or to write to, to their local member. And they did that through their mailing lists and, and they were, and I thought, and that was using those sort of networks is, was, was quite effective and can be, and I've seen it in other campaigns around censorship and things like that, where get the, the, the businesses to, to really try and advocate, <coughs> provide them with the material, <laughs> Absolutely, um, and provide them with the resources, but use them as a, as a conduit to to get to get more consumers on board. Can I just quick, quickly say? I mean, as a lawyer, we pay a lot of te attention to precedent. I learned an awful lot in campaigning on dealing with um, tobacco and nicotine by reading about what people have done in other things. I mean, this is very. It's like watching the same Shakespearean play. They're just different actors, but you know how it's going to go. What happened in, in battles on dealing with AIDS? You know, what, what happened on gay rights? What happened on women's rights? You know, what happened on civil rights in general? I mean, there's a tremendous range of, of things where we can learn what others did because we're following in the footsteps that, that others have for so long. The, the whole movement to human rights, you know, has been a very long process and often use the same sorts of techniques that we can use now because we're just continuing that battle. Okay, um, well that would be back banked with his quick question he said, and, no. uh, and then Muriel, and then I think we might have to wrap up. This, this is just to confirm what you've been saying. I think we all need some good news, and the good news is it works to try to remind politicians that vapors, snooze users are also <coughs> voters. SNPs users in Sweden represent 17% of the voting population and what we have seen now in the election to the European Parliament is that 76% of all top candidates for all Swedish parties are now pro ending the EU SNPs ban. The arguments that are being put forward against vaping and harm reduction in general is they have this um, emotional nature. It's think about the children and um, let's not forget um, that our children, uh, a whole generation got hooked on nicotine uh, ages ago and they were still not able to quit. So I found that you cannot fight emotional arguments with facts. It just doesn't work. So the only way to counter that is by storytelling. I think storytelling is really the most important weapon that we have, and we need to use it. Yeah. I, there's a couple of things I'd like to add. I completely agree with your premise, by the way. The, the, the stories are the things that cut through. Okay, but I would add a couple of things. I think you can, the kids issue is used absolutely ruthlessly, it's shameful the way they do it. Um, and if you, could mer if you could magically solve the kids problem, they, wouldn't, they would still have problems with vaping. They're being used as leverage against the product as a whole. Where I think facts come in is that you can use them to create doubt uh, in the mind of somebody who is committed. So, you, so in the case of the kids thing, what you'll find is that almost all of the regular teenage vapors are also smokers, okay? Now that then, and you can say, well in that case the vaping may be doing them some good. It may be diverting them from a life of smoking. It doesn't mean that they are, oh you've got a point, I was wrong all along, uh, game over, I'm backing you. They, what, but what it does is make them less confident in using that argument in future and it may take some of the force out of that argument if there's, if there's doubt there. And there are several, I mean, don't want to go into them now, but there are several arguments about kids that you can use to sort of diffuse its power. The other thing I think of is what, what are our kids? What's the equivalent argument on our side? And, uh, and I don't mean this in a sort of like, you know, disgracefully using them, but another very emotive group is the very poor and very vulnerable, the homeless, 
uh, people with mental, mental health mm -hmm. disorders, the mm -hmm. indigenous people. You know, the, these are people, again, who's, you know, tend to be much, much high, uh, higher prevalence of smoking, <coughs> higher intensity of smoking, for whom the economic costs as well as the health costs are huge, uh, cuts into their income in a big way. I think being able to tell stories about those groups and coming at the issue from the, well, it's not all one way, it's not all kids versus, you know, grown-up adults. It's a, it's a it is, obviously are grown-up adults, but it is, you know, there is a different emotive story to tell here as well on the other side. Uh, and I, I think that breaks through when you get these people who want to just ban everything. So what are they going to do? What's, what's, their, what's their life going to be like in, you know, in the institution they're in or whatever? Okay, thanks. Um, we really have to wrap it up there, I'm afraid. We've uh, overrun by a little bit. We'll have to pick that up during the day. But I'd just like, first of all, to say thank you to Fiona, Clive, David, Kim, and uh, Evelyn for being on this panel. And could you all give them a round of applause? Please? thing before you go, uh, the next one we'll start, we've got break for 15 minutes. I uh, just want to say that there's a raffle being held um, at this GFN um, and the funds uh, for the receipts for the raffle are going towards the NNA, which is, um, which is handy for us. So I hope you all could be very generous. We've got some good prizes there and it's going to be drawn tomorrow afternoon apparently. So one, one final can, I, can I just plug the, uh, the session on Saturday, which is an open forum debate. So if you didn't get to ask your questions today, but Fiona and I will be on that panel because we're the most argumentative session of the uh, of the entire <laughs> tournament. Uh, so do turn up for that and keep your questions coming. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs>